Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Our Anchor Presbyterian Church to our virtual service. A special welcome to you if you are visiting with us today, and we hope whether you have been coming every week since last March or if you're a brand new visitor, we hope you'll let us know that you're here, who you are and where you're from, and say hello to everyone. We love to know who's been watching, and that holds true even if you are not watching with us live. If you're watching sometime later in the week or in the future, we'd love to know that you were here. So please comment and like and share this video so that we can continue to spread the word about our awesome church. Just a couple of announcements for this morning. This is Communion Sunday, so if you have not already gathered them, please get your elements ready, your bread or wine or juice or crackers, whatever you've got to celebrate communion together as a virtual community. Also, this morning, um, Adult Sunday School has been canceled just for today. It should resume next week, but it is canceled for today. This coming week, actually tomorrow, is the first of two discussions on the Lenten book study, IRL, which inspired this sermon series. So it is a book that um, I enjoyed so much. It's probably one of my favorite that I read this year. It's okay if you've not read the book. It's going to be a discussion where anyone could participate and maybe have some helpful opinions or experiences because the topic is how are we learning to connect in new ways with all of these online technologies. In this virtual age of the pandemic, what are some ways that we find our spiritual needs being met or not being met? So it's something anyone can participate in tomorrow night over Zoom, 7 to 8.30. Anyone is welcome. You don't have to be a member of Christ Our Anchor to be a part of it. So I hope you all will join me then. Also, um, in just a few weeks on Palm Sunday, March 28th, we will be having our annual One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Millions of people in our world lack access to sustainable food resources, clean water, sanitation, and education. But the three programs supported by One Great Hour of Sharing, which are Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and Self-Development of People, they all work together in different ways to serve individuals and communities in need. This is the largest offering of the year that we take. It's been around for 70 years, but perhaps it's more important this year than ever. So we encourage you to plan to give on Palm Sunday, March 28th, to this special offering. And you can get to our website on ChristOurAnchorPC.org and click the Give Now button. It'll allow you to give to this special offering. And my last announcement is that you might have an e-bulletin that you received by email. This would be a good time to pull that out. But you'll also notice on the screens, we are starting to incorporate more of the text of the prayers and the scripture, so making it easier to follow along at home. So you can choose how you'd like to participate. But let's continue on with our opening prayer. Holy God, you know that we have not led a blameless life. We have not done what is right in your sight or spoken the truth that you have sealed in our hearts. We have done harm to both those we love and to those we refuse to love as we should. We have not been faithful stewards of that which we have been blessed and have hoarded that which should be shared with the least of these. Redeeming God, save us from our foolishness and guide us to your wisdom. Gather us in your righteousness and redemption. Forgive us, for we are seeking your light and your salvation. Cleanse us of our brokenness that we might do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with you. Amen. Friends, because we are not worthy to enter God's dwelling, God came to dwell with us through the body and being of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. This is the time where we want to have a message for all of the ages in our church, especially our children. So if you are one of the young people with us right now, please let us know that you're here. We love to know, especially that our kids are watching uh, at any time. But today, I want to talk with you all about a subject very popular in churches, and that's the subject of love. Now, I want you to think with me. When we think of love, what is a symbol of love? 
What's, what do we think of when we think of love? I think most of us think of this first. Like if we want to send love on our phone or in a message, we'll put a little heart. Sometimes we'll say, I heart to you. So that's a big symbol of love, right? Another symbol of love, thank you to Joan Henderson who gave me some of these great uh, object lessons for us. Another symbol of love might be a flower. You love someone, you give them something beautiful to say, oh, I really value you, you're so important to me. But you know, these symbols, we often connect them to romantic love. So like a boyfriend or girlfriend or spouses together, um, someone who we love in that way. But what about all the other kinds of love? Love for our parents, for our grandparents, love for siblings, maybe sometimes that's a love-hate love, isn't it? Uh, love for our friends. And then what Jesus is talking about today, love for our neighbor. What does that look like? Does a heart really symbolize that or a flower? I think the best symbol for love for our neighbor is this. I don't know if you can see this. This is a dirty gardening glove. You can see it's all torn up. It's got dirt and soil that will probably never come out. It's a dirty glove. It's about getting your hands dirty. Maybe you guys have heard that phrase. So loving our neighbor, I think, is all about the actions that we take. It's not just about giving nice gifts or saying nice things or feeling love for them. It's about what we do. It's about seeing a need, even a small need, and trying to meet it. So maybe you have a next door neighbor who's a little older and you see them carrying a heavy box and you go and you offer to help them. Or maybe you knew during the pandemic that your neighbor was a little scared to go to the grocery store because they were worried about the virus. So your family offered to go and get them groceries. We're gonna hear a story today about loving our neighbors. And that is going to give us Jesus's idea of what loving our neighbor really looks like. So I want you to listen to that with me as we go into the scripture. But first, let us pray. Let me see your praying hands out there. Maybe your parents can take a picture of you praying. And as you're at home listening, repeat after me, friends. Dear God, we know that it's not always easy to show real love. Help us through your Holy Spirit to be willing to get our hands dirty by helping others out, even when it's hard to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Thank you, Mike, and thanks be to God for this amazing story of the Good Samaritan. We are in week three of our sermon series called Jesus IRL, which means in real life. 
It's a series where we're trying to take all these lessons that we're learning for better or worse in this pandemic virtual age and connect them with the timeless lessons that we get from Jesus on how do we connect authentically with each other in this world. Because after all, Jesus is God, I-R-L, right? We have been using stories from Jesus from the Gospel of Luke. And today we actually move into a story that's not about Jesus, but it's a story that Jesus himself tells for a very particular purpose. Jesus loved to do that. When people would ask the impossible questions or present head-scratching ethical dilemmas, Jesus would never give direct answers. Instead, he would tell a good story. And story time today with Jesus is quite a doozy. It is one of the hands-down most famous stories or parables that Jesus ever told. But before we dive into it, let's ask again, what made Jesus tell this story? So you heard an expert of the law came to Jesus with a question that many others have asked after him. Maybe you have asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And you could ask this other ways. How do I get to heaven? How do I get saved? How do I know what happens to me after I die? But what I hear in those questions is a lot of fear. See, this guy, he knew the law inside and out. Supposedly, he knew how to do all the right things. But what I think is the question underneath the question is, is it all enough? Am I enough? Before Jesus tells his story, he answers the lawyer's question with another question. Classic teacher, right? And he asks this expert, well, what do you read in the law? Basically, what do you think? He turns it back on him. And this man gives some great straight A Sunday school answers, right? He gives the two greatest commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Sermon done, all tied up, right? Because Jesus even tells this guy he is absolutely right. But the lawyer is not satisfied because technically he already knew the answers, I think. He knew what he was supposed to do. He just wasn't exactly sure how to do it. So he asked Jesus another question, which, get, which gets more at the core of his uncertainty and our uncertainty. And that question is, who is my neighbor? Define the terms, Jesus. Who are we talking about here? Who counts? And what does love for them look like, really, I-R-L? We ask these things, I know we do. We do mental calculations every single day, trying to figure out what we can do to stay ahead, to keep people liking us, to look like we're okay. What must we do? And then maybe what can we get away with not doing? I am betting that this lawyer would have preferred a really detailed and legal explanation with clear lines, right? Like a neighbor is someone of Jewish descent, like you who lives no more than three miles from your nice neighborhood who picks up after their dog, right? But instead, he got this story. Most of us know the plot of the story. We've heard this before. So let's try to get into the mindset of some of the characters. Levites and priests were pretty holy people, assisting and leading the worship in the temple. They had to maintain a certain degree of purity, and they also, because of their roles, they were very important people in that their community relied on them to do something that not just anybody could step in and do. So they needed to stay safe and well. That could be why they passed this man by who was robbed and left for dead, but I'm not sure. They were also human beings. So maybe they were simply tired or afraid or discouraged from a bad day and felt that they had nothing else to give. God knows we've all been there. We've felt those things. But then what about the person who actually helps this man? It's hard for us today to fully comprehend just how bizarre it was that Jesus made this man a Samaritan. Do you remember hearing stories in the Bible about way back when Israel was in exile? Well, the conquerors of the land who burnt Israel's city and carried them away, they did leave some of the people of Israel in the land. Those who remained, called Samaritans, they learned to worship without a temple. They learned to blend their customs with the customs of their conquerors 
That was survival for them. But when the exile was over and everybody returned to the land, their life looked very different. They did not necessarily see the need to rebuild the temple. They didn't see the need to return to these strict purity practices from before the exile. So they were deemed unclean by the real Jewish people. When Jesus was telling this story, Jews and Samaritans hated each other. There was a deep division between them such that one side did not take the other side seriously on anything in life. Not God, not worship, not even how to make a nice loaf of challah bread. Each was passionately convinced that the other one was just plain wrong or even immoral. Does that sound familiar? It would have been one thing for Jesus to say that the Samaritan was the one beaten in the ditch and a Jewish person stepped in and helped them. But to flip the script like this, to make the Samaritan the hero, scandalous. It honestly would be like Jesus saying that a member of ISIS saved one of our American lives. I want to tell you my own story here, my own sort of confession that'll help open this up a little more. Just in the last month, I was going for a walk with my sister back in the neighborhoods around the church. We do that pretty often. It was a nice sunny day, but I was in a gloomy mood. A lot of things were weighing on me and were feeling uncertain. And with that mood, as we were walking, we walked past a house with a giant flag on its side, promoting a political candidate who I really disagree with. Maybe more accurately, I'd say that this candidate for me embodies everything wrong in the world right now. So they are like my Samaritans. And my feelings took over, and I turned and gave the house two big thumbs down with a raspberry sound, like So that's just blowing off steam. Harmless, right? Except, whoops, the owner of the house was in the driveway. I didn't see him. And let's just say he got pretty mad at me. No major consequences, but no real resolution either. And I'm confident I ruined this guy's day. And my careless actions, they ruined my day too. Now, (laughs) my husband Jason told me not to tell this story because nobody here at the church wants to hear about their pastor doing something so out of character, he said. But here's the thing. It's not out of character. I'd venture to say it's not really out of character for any of us. We try to be kind, we pray, we hold to our beliefs, but when push comes to shove and it's time to act, often we don't act right. I don't act right. In that moment, I was not a good neighbor. I disobeyed Jesus' commands, and with you, I'm learning to do better. The Samaritan is my hero. Jesus is saying that in order to truly live We have to love our neighbor like this Samaritan, like someone who we might even despise. You notice Jesus didn't actually even answer the lawyer's initial question. The lawyer had been trying to draw up some lines about who was and wasn't his neighbor, but instead, Jesus' answer is more about how we can actually be neighbors, how we can do that. We don't have neighbors, we are neighbors. Jesus spent all this time in his story detailing specific, concrete actions that the Samaritan took. The biggest thing that the Samaritan did was he did not pass by. He did not look away from another human being suffering that came into his path. The Samaritan instead came near, the story said. There's no limit to opportunities for us to fulfill these teachings, to live up to this story. And now... We can do this online, not just in our in-person lives. So let's look at a few more lessons for ourselves here. For one, and one that sort of follows up on my embarrassing story, I wonder who we consider good, whose actions we allow to inspire our actions. Is it possible that maybe we could learn about being a good neighbor from someone whom we disagree with the most? Are we able to believe that maybe someone who thinks about our country and race and poverty and abortion and all these hot button issues differently from us might still know about how to care for other people in ways that we do not? 
To use online language, maybe instead of jumping to unfollowing those who bother us, we can actually go deeper with them, learn more of their story, learn what they care about, and where they may be able to help us learn. We may disagree with every single one of their beliefs, but the thing is, actual actions are what matter. As Barbara Brown Taylor preached on this parable, she said, right beliefs don't change a thing unless they lead to right actions. She got a burst of applause for that simple statement. Furthermore, maybe many of us, we see way too many people left for dead in this world and we get overwhelmed. Maybe instead of trying to bandage up every single one of them as they keep coming, maybe we address the bigger system. Dr. King preached about this parable and pointed out that the larger problem was that the Jericho Road was incredibly dangerous. An 18 mile winding path down a mountain. People got mugged and beaten there all the time and there's something wrong with that. He said in that sermon, quote, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. So what would it look like to throw our coins and our influence and our privilege and energy behind changing harmful broken systems and structures like that Jericho Road? Maybe that is being a good neighbor to people who we may, well, perhaps will never even meet. And then I want to challenge us with one more thing, a little further here, because I think that people in churches like ours, we tend to be pretty fortunate. We have a certain amount of wealth and security, at least enough that our minds tend to align themselves with the Samaritan, with the helper. But what if sometimes we are the ones in the ditch? What about those times where maybe we are in desperate need of help? I think it's very hard for many of us to admit when we're in those times, but maybe we need to identify with someone whose main defining thing about them is need and brokenness before we can live out the compassion of the Good Samaritan. Some of you have already been there, broken on the Jericho Road, in that hospital room, at that graveside, signing those divorce papers, applying for that unemployment, and so you know, once again, that in those times, you do not care what anyone else believes. What matters is who will help you through. So instead of thinking of ourselves as the nice and good helpers, can we admit that maybe there's a lot that we don't know? That maybe unlikely and even unlikable people might be the ones to help us through it, to show us mercy? Can we accept that? We cannot be saved until we open ourselves up to new stories like this one. Until we see that we are not always the ones who are good or the ones who know everything. Yet God comes to us anyway and shows us all grace. And we make that God more real for each other. It's not about any obligations or shoulds. What should I do for my neighbor? It's about responding to a gift that has already been given to us. God came to us in the ditch, and our call then is to embody that grace going forward. The IRL book that I'm reading and studying with some of you this week, it points out that the fastest growing religious group out in there in the world these days is the nuns, those who do not want to choose any faith at all. And that is primarily because churches have acted like the Levite and the priest and not the Good Samaritan. They have looked away from suffering or worse, condemned those who suffer. So for the spiritual needs of belonging, guidance, comfort, meaning, they've turned instead to spaces online, especially in the last year. As disciples, we've been given the chance to embody God's love IRL, but also in those online spaces. Those online spaces have increasingly become echo chambers that just parrot back to us what we already think and believe, as opposed to stretching us and challenging us. So maybe we still have a role here as churches. If we can continue to adapt to that online neighborhood and broaden our welcome of those who we meet there. Who do we listen to there? And who do we pass by? Who do we pray for 
Or who do we antagonize, like I did in that shameful moment with my neighbor? What would it look like to bandage up another's wounds or allow ourselves the vulnerability of admitting wounds in those virtual spaces? How can we make those encounters more real? We are in strange times because we are still in this pandemic. It is not gone, yet there are signs that many have been waiting for that we are moving back towards normal. But getting back to what we are used to brings with it the temptations of the priest and the Levite to just not be affected, to not stop, to keep moving forward. But maybe we can just model prayerful care for each other, coming nearer to each other, because we know many will be affected by this pandemic long after the worst of it is over. I want to close this sermon with the thoughtful words of Deborah Dean Murphy. We need to practice a regard for the humanity of another that wants their well-being so much that we are willing, we are called to confront their fear, fragility, and paranoia so that we might love to death all that robs them of love and that harms those they think they cannot love. This love is the antithesis of sentimentality, feeling for feeling's sake. It is instead the risky, emotionally exhausting work of encounter, a humanizing love that helps us see together the wounds in need of healing. Friends, with God's help, may it be so. Amen. Our consumer culture sends us many messages about what it means to give and to give well. It tells us to give when it directly benefits us, give when we have a lot left over, give out of a sense of duty. Our faith invites us to a deeper way of giving back to our world. Our faith says that when we give back, it is a response to God's gifts to us. It is acknowledging that God provides for us. It is a holistic way to participate in God's dreams for us. In this way, the invitation of our faith is an invitation to freedom. In these times that seem so scary and uncertain, our church hopes that you will continue to give yourselves and your lives. Give cheerfully, give courageously, give in faith. And thank you for all that you give.
One of the things that is the great honor of this church is the chance to support each other by praying for each other. And now during this pandemic, we have been able to broaden that prayer to cover those who are states away, people who have never even set foot in our church. So that has been a really cool thing about this time. And I would encourage you, just like we said in the sermon, to share of the things that feel like wounds to you and to help bandage up others who are hurting by this time of prayer. So whenever you watch this, whether it's live or after this service, we would love to know what we can pray for for you. Our church church doesn't just say we'll pray. It usually follows up with a phone call or an offer of a meal or an offer of a ride or whatever is needed. So let's open ourselves up to the help and love of each other. And today I'm going to do what we've been doing during Lent and make use of our Lenten banner behind me. So as I pray for each concern, I'm going to put a nail in the banner. And maybe as I'm putting those in, you can also think of what you need to give away and pin to God's mercy, to put it in God's hands. So let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this beautiful morning. We thank you for the gift of being able to be together even as we are still apart physically. Thank you for the gift of gathered community in new ways during these times. And we thank you for all of the blessings in each of our lives, but you know that we have many concerns. We do give them all into your care and mercy right now. And we pray especially for things named in community. We pray for Beth Perry's daughter, Alyssa, who is recovering from surgery this past Wednesday. We pray for our longtime former member, Don Kewitt, who was hospitalized and had quadruple heart bypass surgery this past week. We pray for Debbie Swigert and her family as her mother passed away peacefully on the morning of March 3rd. We continue prayers for M. Forbes' dear friend Mercedes, who died suddenly at age 34 last month. And we continue prayers for her loved ones, especially her husband Paul, for Jill, nieces and nephew Olivia, Trey, and Autumn, for family Casey, and for Larry. We pray for Jane Bartlett's cousin Laura May, who has heart valve surgery scheduled for this Thursday. We pray uh, for me and my family for safety, protection, and positive results for a procedure happening this week. We pray for Judy Clark's friend Lucy, who is having all kinds of health problems, God, and a lot of changes and decisions to be made. We pray for Carl Link, who will be leaving on Tuesday from or left this past Tuesday from his post in San Diego and has some travel scheduled before new posts in Virginia, Rhode Island, and then ultimately Japan this fall. We pray for Roy Field and for his entire assisted living facility under quarantine because of new cases of COVID and for all who are affected continually by this virus. And God, we continue prayers for Tom and Marilyn Rorick. We pray for Marilyn's um, ongoing strength and endurance as she is seeking treatment, whatever treatment is available for her cancer, Lord. Please be with her and her family. And God, we pray all of these things knowing that you are there for us in every step of our journey. We know that you invite us to share our concerns and our joys, great and small. And so we do give them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. I think it's more important now than ever, friends, for us to engage in rituals that heighten our five senses. We are not able to be together in body. So in spirit, we join in things that use our taste, touch, smell, hearing, and sight. So now we enter into the time of communion. Jesus was smart to give us something we could hold on to, 
something that involves things that come from the earth to remind us that we too were made of the stuff of the earth. We are only human, just as he was, but we are also endowed with God's Holy Spirit and able to do great things, called to do great things. So in that spirit, let us pray the great prayer of thanksgiving together. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that you did not look down on us from above, from far away, but you came near to us. You saw us wounded and hurting and you took action. You came to us and took care of us. You became one of us. You know what it is like to be wounded yourself. We thank you for that incredible and unique gift of our faith. And we pray that when we hurt, we may connect to you, our wounded God. We pray that when we feel joy, we may connect and celebrate with you. And we thank you for this meal, which is a reminder of a ritual shared with you going all the way back to your life. And that in taking in the bread and the wine, that we might be reminded that your spirit and your presence continue to live on in us, empowering us for great things. So we bless today these elements, whatever we have at home, and we pray that they would nourish and feed us. In the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his friends together for a simple meal. He took bread, he broke it, and he said, take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, again he gave thanks, and he poured it out saying, take this, all of you, and drink. This is the cup of my blood, cup of the new and everlasting covenant, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite all of you now to gather whatever elements you have, Get your bread or cracker or bagel or whatever you've got, and we'll take it together as a community. Friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Take and eat. Friends, together let's take the cup. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Take and drink. Please join me in our concluding prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this supper shared in the spirit with your son, Jesus, who makes us new and strong, who brings us life eternal. We praise you for giving us all good gifts in him and pledge ourselves to serve you even as in Christ you have served us. 
Amen. My benediction for you was written by a fellow pastor as a good Samaritan's blessing. So may we go out from this place and recognize God the creator in surprising acts of kindness. May we experience the human God in tiny acts of extraordinary love. And may we demonstrate the courage of God's spirit in all we do, in all we say, to friends, to strangers, today and every day. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.